Sadie, what's this big dramatic music opening? Could you tell I was going for a Hans Zimmer style opening here? Yeah, but I don't know why. Well, just a few days ago, the newest Christopher Nolan movie was released. So, of course we're talking about... Barbie! No, Ian Oppenheimer. (laughs) And while I wasn't able to swing us an early showing before recording this episode, it still seemed like we should talk about the history of the Manhattan Project and some of the mathematics involved. Cool. Did you get an early showing of Barbie, or is that... I got nothing for you, bud. Nothing. Wait, isn't there something about the University of Chicago building a nuclear reactor under a football field or something? The University of Chicago was absolutely a key location for the Manhattan Project and the development of nuclear fission. But you got some of those details wrong. And before we dig in... Mm. Introductions? I'm Sadie Witkowski. And I'm Ian Martin. And you're listening to Carry the Two, a podcast from the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, a.k.a. MC. This is the podcast where Sadie and I talk about the real-world applications of mathematical and statistical research. Or, in this case, how Hollywood gets mathematical. We might seem like an odd couple to tackle these topics, as a high school choir director and a neuroscientist, respectively. But it turns out that you don't need a math degree to see how mathematics plays a key role in all sorts of unexpected places. Now, back to what you were saying about the University of Chicago. In the early 40s, we had the first reactor in Chicago, right? And so we went from, it it was like a span of five years or less from understanding fission theoretically to building the first reactor. It was actually in a squash court. So they needed a space and the stadium was no longer being used. So they grabbed the, the squash courts and that's where it started. Oh, two guests today? That's right. I nabbed us two researchers with backgrounds in nuclear energy and engineering. I'm Paul Wilson, the Granger Professor of Nuclear Engineering and the Chair of the Department of Nuclear Engineering and Engineering Physics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So my name is Robert Rosner, and I'm the... I'm not going to tell you my full title, but I'm a professor in uh, in the Astronomy and astrophysics department, in the physics department, in the Enrico Fermi Institute, and the Harris School of Public Policy. As the former head of the Bolton of Atomic Scientists, Robert knew quite a bit about the Chicago origins of nuclear research. Apparently, it wasn't a bomb, but the first nuclear reactor that was built underground at the university. And it wasn't beneath an actively used football field. Rather, it was in the basement in what was previously a squash court under the stands of Stag Field. I guess that court was the perfect place to squash their misconceptions about nuclear fission. Uh, uh, (laughs) okay. Well, then why were they there? So the two centers uh, for physicists was here in Chicago and uh, at Berkeley. And I would say that the Berkeley crowd at that time was already thinking about uh, how to build the bomb whereas the folks here were uh, interested in trying to figure out whether you could actually get the chain reaction to to go. Chicago was partially chosen for strategic reasons. Since we're in the middle of the country and we already had researchers with the proper expertise, apparently the nuclear reactor project at UChicago was codenamed the Metallurgical Laboratory. Nothing like a boring scientific name to keep people from looking too closely. (laughs) A boring name for groundbreaking research. So then why do we always refer to the Manhattan Project and not the Chicago Project? Well, Robert has an explanation for that. The Manhattan Project actually started in Manhattan in Columbia, Columbia University. And Fermi was actually a professor there. He had, when, when he came from, from Italy, when he and his wife left because his wife was Jewish, they ended up in New York and they started the project at Columbia. And um, there are two problems uh, with the site, a number of problems. Uh, one was uh, it was in New York. And that's a problem because it was close to the Atlantic Ocean. If it was not, it was kind of accessible to bad people, Germans who might be spying. There, there certainly were lots of spies around. That's one problem. The other problem was that the space that they had was probably not large enough. For me, I already knew that was going to be a problem. 
that the space they had was not going to be able to hold the ultimate object they were trying to build, which is the, uh, the reactor. The third problem was that uh, there were multiple sites with, uh, for the Manhattan Project, and they were all coastal. The problem was they were on the opposite coast. The other big group was um, at Berkeley. So at that time, you know, they had propeller planes, not jet planes. And so it's a, it was a big haul to get from one place to the other. So, so there are a whole bunch of reasons uh, to basically figure out a more central location for that project. Mm-hmm. And um, it turns out that um, uh, the University of Chicago had a bunch of physicists, including the Dean of Physical Sciences at that time, who said, why don't we have it here? So while the origins were at Columbia, the University of Chicago gets the honor of building the first chain reaction reactor. So what did this early reactor look like? So CP1, or Chicago Pile 1, as it was nicknamed, was just a 20-foot tall pile of graphite with small uranium blocks inserted in it. And, of course, there were also the cadmium control rods that could then be inserted and moved to control the reaction. So it was just a pile of pencil lead? This is not exactly what I was expecting for the origins of the atomic bomb. The research question is, what's the critical mass? Okay. So in order to know that, what you need to know is what's called the uh, uh, interaction cross-section for neutrons with a Iranian atom. What does that mean? What's the probability that when a neutron comes along and hits a uranium-235, the fissile form, that would split? Okay, that's what, it, that's what they needed to know. Now, the thing is that when the uranium atom does split, neutrons come out, So I know that was kind of jargon-laden, but let me break it down for you. Oh, thank goodness. The basic idea of a nuclear reactor is to split atoms. Okay, hence the atomic bomb. Right. So some elements, like the atomically heavy uranium, can be radioactive, meaning that they throw off neutrons as they decay. A nuclear reactor is basically a way of organizing uranium so that the decay of neutrons hits other nearby uranium atoms and makes them split off to even more neutrons carrying on the reaction. You might call it a chain reaction. (laughs) And that's the tricky part. Once you get it going, how do you prevent the chain reaction from becoming a runaway train or a bomb? How do you control it? How do you slow these neutrons down? And the answer is... Uh, you use either heavy water or a material called graphite. It's carbon. Okay. So what they had done is they <clears throat> they have a bunch of bunch of uh, uranium here, piece of graphite next to it, and on the other side you see how many. You look at the neutrons coming out. Indeed, they're slow, and then you can hit another pile of uranium. So basically, you can use either graphite or another substance called heavy water to slow down the neutrons and allow for the reaction to take place in a controlled manner. And heavy water is? It's basically a form of water that's more dense because it has a heavier isotope of hydrogen than regular H2O. Okay, so the 20-foot pile of graphite you mentioned earlier is like a speed bump to keep the reaction in check? And this was the experimental breakthrough at UChicago that managed to help us beat out the Nazis in creating a nuclear reactor. It, so it turns out that um, the commercial graphite that we're using has a contaminant. The contaminant is a, another element called boron. And boron was known to physicists as a big-time absorber of neutrons. Oops. So it turns out that's a very big deal. Because the Germans never figured that out. So the Germans also knew that graphite and heavy water could be moderators. They did the same tests. Graphite doesn't seem to work. But the researchers at the University of Chicago had pure graphite, and so they got the reactor working first? Yep, unlike the Germans that had contaminated graphite with the boron. And... Oppenheimer was there? Well, no, actually. Fermi came here to Paris on the Prairie, as Chicago sometimes was called. But Oppenheimer was conducting research at the same time over at Berkeley. Midwest wasn't good enough for him? (laughs) I suppose not. Very rude. So 
going back to the theme of the episode, is Robert just like a movie nitpicker? Like, will he be annoyed if they state a fake equation or get the dimensions wrong? I I am sometimes a nitpicker, but I, I, I I'm gonna watch it just for the enjoyment. Right. I'm curious about what the movie, how how the movie is gonna portray him. Whether it was true to that that fundamental fact, which is that he was a very very complicated person. But is that really the theme of our podcast? <laughs> I thought the theme of Carrie the Two was the math and stats behind how the world works. I mean, that too, which now that you mention it, we've really been focused on the physics of it all. What is the math involved here? This is where I'll let Paul take over. But as a quick primer slash reminder, differential equations are the equations with one or more derivatives of a function. Basically, the equation contains derivatives of one or more dependent variables with respect to one or more independent variables. So there's multiple moving parts, so to speak. Okay, go for it, Paul. Broadly speaking, there's a lot of differential equations. You know, we work in both the spatial domain and the time domain. So you know, the fundamental the fundamental equations that describe how a reactor works are partial differential equations. Um, usually, we break them into the time-dependent part and the and the spatial dependent part and deal with them as separate problems. Only, and when we, you know, back to my area of modeling and simulation, it's really only kind of recent and ongoing research to be able to deal with them in full three dimensions, including time as a full simulation. That's where you do need the supercomputers. Um, if you look at, and, and then there's also very many different time scales. And they had supercomputers back in the 40s? Well, no. And they also weren't working on reactor for producing energy. That's a much more modern direction of research. Back then, they were just trying to see if they could control such a reaction at all. They weren't focused on using it to create energy. Okay, so we use supercomputers now to understand how things develop over time and make sure reactor doesn't go critical, a la Chernobyl. Right. It's the much shorter time scales that really matter for things like nuclear bombs. The very short time scale is what happens in nuclear weapon. Right, you know the the characteristic physics time scale is fractions of a millisecond. You know, if we had to control nuclear reactors at that time scale, we wouldn't be able to. And so, one of the interesting, you know, interesting quirks of nature is that the chain reaction that causes fission to happen relies on things that come out at more of like an eighty, you know, somewhere between a tens of seconds and eighty second time scale. And so, because of that, it's a fraction of a percent. But it's that fraction of a percent happening at that slower time scale that allows us to have controllable nuclear energy in reactors. And so without that delayed fraction, we call them delayed neutrons, without that 0.7% of our neutrons being delayed, we would never be able to have nuclear power plants. We would only be able to have nuclear bombs. I guess timing really is everything. <laughs> so it's this interesting mix of mathematical formulas and also understanding statistics to predict how many of the freed neutrons are going to hit another uranium atom and continue the reaction. Actually, speaking of supercomputers. Um, and there's all kinds of angles to that story, one of which is they didn't have supercomputers. And so they had rooms full of people doing these calculations. And many of them were women because the most many of the men were off fighting the war. And so there's a really, I think, a really interesting story about so sort of the role of women in mathematics and statistics as, as some of the, the computers, the human computers, first exploring this Monte Carlo method for sampling distributions and using those samples to, to understand how a nuclear reactor reaction would evolve and, and what that would mean for a nuclear weapon. Shout out to another excellent mathy movie, Hidden Figures. Right. That's the film about the women computers whose calculations put a man on the moon and features one of my all-time faves, Janelle Monet. Oh, my gosh. And her new album is so good. I know. Anyway, so are we going to talk about what a Monte Carlo method is? Mm, that's getting a bit off topic from Oppenheimer, so I'll try to keep it short. Basically, it's a broad class of algorithms that repeatedly sample a distribution. In the case of Paul's research, he uses this method to repeatedly sample what a neutron is doing as uranium atoms split and spit out these subatomical particles to hopefully hit into another uranium atom and then continue the process. 
Wow, that's way more mathematically complex than anything I learned in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and funny enough, Paul feels like he's not really a mathy guy. Why not? Well, for him, these calculations are based on physical processes, and that's the aspect that he really cares about. Fortunately, for in, in this nuclear engineering application, and for me, anyways, there's a there's a very clear connection between what's going on in the in the math and what's going on in the physics. Because every probability distribution we're sampling represents a physical process that we can have a physical intuition about and then go from there. Okay, so I get this all as like a big picture conceptual kind of thing, but can you give me something more concrete here? Like what's happening in a nuclear reactor? Well, like we said, it's a process of splitting atoms called fission sending neutrons skittering away into another uranium atom and then splitting those atoms. But I'll let Paul take it from here. Let's say we get two neutrons out from every fission event. If one of those neutrons, we need one of them exactly to continue the chain. If some fraction of the time, one of those extra neutrons also causes a fission, then we grow, right? And if some fraction of the time, one of those neutrons doesn't cause a fission, then we shrink. This kind of reminds me of when we were first talking about the pandemic and the R not value, right? Which is the idea of how many, when, when a person is sick, how many other people are they mm -hmm. infecting? If it's like, well, usually it's one person, but sometimes it's two, but sometimes it's zero. It's giving you that same right. cascade chain that is like just predictable enough. Right. And I'll, I'll tell you, nuclear engineers very deeply understood what was happening at the beginning of the pandemic, because the math of controlling a nuclear reactor is identical to the math of a pandemic at the onset. You know, things are growing exponentially and how fast they grow exponentially depends on this parameter, right? And so that's what we, we look at, right? Is that, that time constant of that exponential growth, you know, if we didn't have this delayed fraction, right? So it's, I guess the analogy, given that the pandemic is so raw in everybody's mind, <laughs> right? The analogy is, you know, that if, if every time the pandemic, every time the, the COVID was transmitted to somebody, if 1% of the time it just happened a week slower than it otherwise happened, then it would have a big impact on slowing, you know, being able to slow down. Going from atomic research back to COVID-19 was not the connection I was expecting here, but I think I see what you're saying. And I should mention that there's a bunch of other math and physics that are needed to go from a conceptual understanding of nuclear reactions to then building an actual functional bomb. Oh, for sure. But I think we need to talk about the legacy of this research, both the dangers and the benefits from it. After a short break? <laughs> After a short break. If you're enjoying the important research shared on our show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show that you should check out. It's called Entitled. Human rights matter, but conversations about rights can be polarizing, confusing, and frustrating. On Entitled, lawyers Claudia Flores and Tom Ginsberg traveled the world getting into the weeds of global human rights debates. They use that expertise to explore the stories and thorny questions around why rights matter and what's the matter with rights. Subscribe to Entitled, part of the award-winning University of Chicago Podcast Network. So you said we were going to cover both the benefits and dangers. But I think the dangers are pretty obvious. Just look at the poster for Oppenheimer. Big mushroom cloud, infamous destruction in Japan caused by the bombs. Do we really need to explain all that? I mean, you're not wrong, but I do think those repercussions are the obvious ones. I mean, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> but I was actually thinking more about the dangers that the researchers themselves faced when working on this research. Because this was groundbreaking, but extremely dangerous work. There's a movie 30 years ago, maybe, about Manhattan Project. And there was a scene of, of something that was, that's called Tickling the Dragon's Tail. Um, and this is where you bring two spheres of uranium together to become close to being critical. And they used to do it, apparently, by just putting a screwdriver between them and then slowly rotating the screwdriver. And once it slipped, and somebody was irradiated, and I think lethally irradiated by the, the, the neutrons that came out of that. And so that's an example of this chain reaction problem. 
Paul saw a dramatization of this scene in another movie, but I think Robert does a more thorough job of explaining how exactly this occurred. It's a very famous accident when um, somebody took... Uh, there were lots of uh, attempts to estimate uh, the critical mass okay, and then how to assemble it, how to put it together, okay? So you don't want to be there when it's assembled <laughs> because when it's assembled, it's a bomb. Uh, but um, even when you have less than a critical mass, uh, we have, say, you know, say half a critical mass, when you assemble it, it really does start to radiate. Okay. One classic accident that actually killed somebody is they had two, two hemispheres that were going to be put together, and they wanted to see just what, what happened as the two hemispheres were put together into the sphere. So there are two ways of doing that. Okay. One way is... You have one ball stationary and the other ball on a hinge that comes down onto the other hemisphere, okay? The other way of doing it is to have the stationary ball be upside down, the hemisphere is upside down, and then the hinged one hemisphere is pulled up. Okay, you know, guess, what's the difference? Well, the difference is, that in one case, you have an accident, which is if you let go of the hinge, falls and you're cooked the other way if you let go it opens up so whoever put it together did it the wrong way and somebody in fact let go of the upper hemisphere it fell and he got killed death by radiation poisoning just because you installed a hinge the wrong way that's heavy yeah the physical dangers are horrific and pretty obvious to spot but we would also be remiss to not talk about the dangerous shift in cultural practices around science that resulted from the Manhattan Project. Oh, like what? Think about the strain that researchers were under at the time, recognizing the destructive power of what they discovered and being uncertain whether they should share that research with the world. And, and I've talked to some historians of science who've, who've brought this up. And again, I'm not an expert on it, but so there's two things that, that I'll point to. One is back to this Making the Atomic Bomb book by Richard Rhodes. He describes a conversation or, or a, um, a reckoning between Lisa Meitner and her nephew. She had escaped Germany as a, Ger a German Jew and had gone to the UK. And she and her nephew were discussing, her nephew was a physicist too, and they were discussing this discovery of fission and whether or not to publish it. And on one side of this argument was, let's not publish it in the hope that it does not become, they, they foresaw its use for destructive purposes. Mm -hmm. And so one line of thinking was, let's not publish this in the hope that we can prevent it from being used for, for evil. But then the flip side was, I've just escaped from Germany where I know that they, you know, it's my colleagues in Germany who've discovered this. If we don't publish it, the Germans will be the only ones who know it, right? And so they cho did choose to publish it. So that's one, I think, interesting anecdote. That's fascinating. It's like an example of one of the many ways that war and conflict can have unforeseen consequences. Modern day researchers talk about academia being a publisher parish kind of space. But in this case, publication could lead to the creation of a weapon, a bomb, when I was in grad school, my research didn't have those immediate applications that could be weaponized. So hearing Paul talk about how all this impacted nuclear engineering and energy research was really eye-opening to me. Right, the idea that there was a large amount of science and interesting physics that was being discovered and, and, and used, but was not, was, was happening inside this closed system and very explicitly not being published. And it lingers to this day. You know, we work with tools in my research group that are export controlled. Um, we have to be careful. Every single person who gets access to it needs to be approved. Um, they have to be aware that they can't share it with anybody else. And so some of there's echoes of the Manhattan Project that are in our day to day life around nuclear science and technology today. And we live in this, you know, this complicated space about the things that we're allowed to share and the things we're not allowed to share. Conveniently, as a high school teacher, I don't really have to worry about this kind of thing. <laughs> Trying to relieve some of the tension after such a tense topic? I mean, I am a middle child, so. <laughs> <laughs> but 
I do wonder how Oppenheimer the movie will deal with this complex reality. Paul wondered the same thing. We're so removed from the Cold War that many people in our society today don't really think about nuclear weapons. They don't think about the destructive nature of nuclear weapons. And so it'll be interesting to see whether or not a movie like this, you know, presuming that it spent some time grappling with that topic, you know, what it brings back into the discourse, particularly among younger people. Oh, yeah. We've been talking about how this impacted science and researchers. But what about the culture at large, like your everyday person? So there was a major psychological shift, I think, for um, many scientists, not just physicists, but also uh, chemists. In fact, probably chemists uh, had that shift even earlier, probably during World War I, because they were so important in chemical warfare. But I think World War II made it very clear that uh, physicists have had a very important role to play in warfare. And that had not been true before on the political side. And realizing that these people that we thought they were these eggheads sitting at the university, God knows what they're doing, uh, actually had very powerful roles to play on the national, international scene because they were the ones that could actually make new kinds of weapons or weapon systems or all sorts of stuff having to do with warfare that is important. And hey, the other people have physicists too. So if we don't use our physicists, that's not going to stop the other folks from using their physicists. We better pay attention to our physicists. That, that was the transformation. Robert pointed out how this was a period where we saw a lot of weaponization of scientific research and how we viewed researchers as a society. I kind of think some of those cultural values have stuck around, too. You mean how, like, comic book villains tend to be mad scientists? Exactly. There's this clear understanding that scientific research can be weaponized. Okay, but going back to the real world, I want to know how much the movie talks about the cultural fallout after dropping the bombs, assuming we get that far in history. You mean like how that ended up leading to the Cold War? Yeah, exactly. Well, going back to Paul... I mean, I think non-proliferation will definitely be part of it because there's a lot of conversation, Oppenheimer and others, around the time when they used the nuclear bombs in Japan, about whether they should, about what they should do afterwards, should they share these this information. There was a huge push among certain circles to take the knowledge of nuclear science and technology and make it and put it in the public domain to avoid it being a secretive arms race. Um, and in fact, you know, advisors to President Truman presented him with this option and suggested that nuclear materials should be under international control, the technology to make this happen should be in the public domain, and then we can, with the hope that we would avoid some sort of um, arms race. Uh, that didn't come to be, of course. So I suspect we'll see some on-screen discussion around the arms race. Hmm. While this episode has certainly been interesting, it's also pretty dark. <laughs> Not the Barbie movie, huh? <laughs> I wish. <laughs> well, we are talking about a Christopher Nolan movie here. Yeah, but I think we've totally missed the opportunity to point out that while this research led to the bomb, it also opened the door for nuclear energy. Yeah, I don't know if the film will cover it, but this was also a topic that really interests Paul. I think that we should be using more nuclear energy around the world. I think that it has an important role to play in addressing climate challenge. Um, I think it can be made into a great partner for other low carbon sources like wind and, and solar. I think you know there's so much focus on, st on storage. I think if we get energy storage at, at grid scales, it will be good for nuclear as well as good for re renewables. And so everything, you know, it's the magic sauce that'll make everything fit together better. See, so we can end on a more hopeful note. Ever the optimist, Ian. <laughs> Don't forget to check out our show notes in the podcast description for more about Oppenheimer, both the man and the movie, as well as the nuclear research done here at the University of Chicago. And if you like the show, give us a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen. By rating and reviewing the show, you really help us spread the word about Carrie the Two so that other listeners can discover us. 
And for more on the math research being shared at MC, be sure to check us out online at our homepage, mc.institute. We're also on Twitter at MC underscore Institute, as well as Instagram at MC dot Institute. And that's MC spelled I-M-S-I. And do you have a burning math question? Maybe you have an idea for a story on how mathematics and statistics connect with the world around us. Send us an email with your idea. You can send your feedback, ideas, and more to Sadie Witt at MC dot Institute. That's S-A-D-I-E-W-I-T at MC dot Institute. We'd also like to thank our audio engineer, Tyler Dammy for his production on the show. And music is from Blue Dot Sessions. Lastly, Carry the Two is made possible by the Institute for Mathematical and Statistical Innovation, located on the gorgeous campus of the University of Chicago. We're supported by the National Science Foundation and the University of Chicago. The trailer for Oppenheimer, which I I did watch last night. Okay. And I was like, that is good music. <laughs> it is good music. It is good so music. So that's where my yeah. Thank you, Hans Zimmer. <laughs>